You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Good morning, good evening, and good night. I'm Johanna in Austria. And I'm Annie, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States of America. Welcome to Fresh Hell. This is the podcast where two women who have never met, this woman is a stranger to me, for all I know, (laughs) she's catfishing me, and this is a real long con. (laughs) We've only ever met online, and we get together every week to talk about our favorite true stories of murder, mystery, and all manner of macabre places, people, and events throughout history. If it's weird Mm. and dark, we're here for it. And as many of you know, we were supposed to meet in 2020, (laughs) but thank God that hasn't happened yet for obvious reason, because I'm actually not who I pretend to be, but you're going to find out soon enough. (laughs) (laughs) One day we will meet, Annie will be so disappointed, and we have so many exciting things planned for when we can finally get together. It's going to be so Like, I'm going to show her my basement. I can't wait to see your basement. So that's going to be exciting. The other thing exciting is all of you absolute newest Patreons out there, our Patreon members. And as always, a huge special shout out to Scully K, Rosie Agnew, Agnew? Yeah, Agnew, I would say. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. Melissa Fogel, Sophie Kleintges, Marshall Halverson, sounds like um, a Nordic name It does. Rory Jensen and Veronica. Hey, Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. So much. Thank you, everybody. If you want to know more about Patreon and all the other ways to support and or contact us, please, please, please listen until the end of this episode because that's when we'll tell you all of that. Because now it's time for this week's case and Annie has something for us. That's right. Did it just get bangy next door again? If anybody hears anything in the background, again, construction site next to me. All right. So I had a YouTube video on about something unrelated, and then because the machines know all of our preferences now, an episode of Cold Case Detective popped up. I'm not sure if I'd seen it before. It was on YouTube, and the title was Two Haunting 1950s Murders That Remain Cold. I will post a link to the YouTube video. It was really interesting, and it did discuss two cases I'd never heard of, uh, both of which I was like, wow, these are fascinating, and I wanted to look more into them. The second of the two cases that they present in that was this particular unsolved murder, and the details are bizarre. A little bit bizarre. And so I started to look into it, but there's almost nothing out there. There is a book, which is a compilation of just a bunch of different cases, like each chapter is a case from the Indianapolis, Indiana area. And the name of that book is Historic Indianapolis Crimes, Murder and Mystery in the Circle City. And that's by Fred D. Cavender. It was great. It's a great book. And it gave me quite a few other cases to look into, actually. But other than that one chapter in the book and the podcast, uh, I think it's a podcast called Case Detective that I listened to, the biggest source were newspapers from the time that cover it. And we get those through newspapers.com. Funnily enough, when I had finished all my notes and finished everything, I was trying to find just a picture of the victim because there's only one out there. There aren't that many photographs. So I just did a quick search and a really well-written Reddit article popped up that I did not read. (laughs) prior to any of this. So I'm going to check that out after we're done recording. But that's it. So anyhow, I thought at the time, I was like, there's just not that much information to do an episode on this case. But I just couldn't stop thinking about it. You know, those cases that you just can't stop thinking about, and you lay awake at night, all of a sudden, certain aspects of the case, you're like, oh, that's actually disturbing. It's creepy. There are a lot of aspects of this case that aren't They're not traditionally creepy things, but for some reason, I find them creepy. And when that happens, then I have to tell you about it, because I just want to make sure I'm the only one who doesn't find it creepy, right? (laughs) Today, I'm going to be telling you everything I know about the baffling, tragic, unsolved murder of Malvina Krutz. I don't know anything about it. I'm all here for it. Are there any warnings? 
Not really. So we're going to discuss the day of the murder and how the body was found, and then we'll kind of rewind and talk about some of the odd facts that we know happened during the day so that we can kind of think about what the timeline might have been. And for content warnings, I think apart from the terrible unsolved murder, oh, there is mention of a domestic violence murder, but not any, I'm not getting into any specifics, but somebody was killed by a spouse in a domestic incident. So adjacent to this case. And that's it. All right. So let's talk just briefly about their families. And this case is more recent. Um, there are absolutely family members who are still living. And for that reason, I'm not going to get too into like as deeply into the family background as I often do for their obvious for their privacy. They have, you know, had to endure the tragedy of losing a loved one to violence and then live with it never having been solved, which, yeah, that's, it's terrible. So our victim is Malvina Sanders, and Malvina is a Scottish name, by the way. It's not a common name. I've never come across it before, so I looked it up, uh, Scottish. She was born in 1916 in Kentucky, and she grew up in Louisville. Melvina was a family name. I did find a census record from the 1920s when Melvina was a toddler, and at that time, her widowed maternal grandmother, so her mother's mother, Melvina Smith, was living with her and her parents, Robert and Ada, and her brother. Sadly, her mother passed away in 1936, so that must have been difficult because Melvina would have only been about 20 years old. That's a hard age to lose your mom. Mm. I lost my mom at 40. How old was I? 43. There's never a good time to lose your mom. But like 20 is, that's tough. Charles Crutz was born in Indiana to a large family. He was one of about 10 kids born to his parents, Charles and Fanny. I'm not sure how they met, Malvina and Charles, but he's seven years older than her, uh, which is the same age difference as myself and Paul. But somehow, Melvina and Charles, they met, they fell in love, and they got married in Jeffersonville, Indiana, in February of 1939. The 1940 census tells us that they are married and living in Louisville, where Charles works for a trucking company, and Melvina works at a retail shoe store as a cashier. Then the Second World War happens, and Charles served in the Army Air Corps, and his draft card shows them living in Evansville, Indiana at that time. After the war, their son is born around 1948. He's a junior, and they usually call him Buddy. I will be referring to him as Buddy. He's 9 or 10 at the time of these events, and he has a paper route. Okay, by paper route, you mean he's delivering newspapers just for our international listeners, because that's not a thing in most countries. Yes, that's what I'm assuming. Back in those days, there were often not just a morning paper, but that back then I think you'd have like a morning and afternoon and sometimes even an evening edition. I think we saw that when we did the Badger Murders in Wakefield, where she had gotten off the train, right, and seen the afternoon edition was how mm. she found out about her family being killed. Yeah, so it would make sense that maybe they had an after school, like, afternoon edition. Also, the town that I live in has a local paper, and our neighbor's son used to deliver that after school. So, yeah, definitely some kind of newspaper delivery. So, it's 1958. Malvina, Charles, and Buddy are now living in Indianapolis, Indiana, in an area that's known as Broad Ripple. So, I messaged our mutual friend Erica, who told me that David Letterman was born in that area. It's incredibly charming. It's a really, really sweet neighborhood, lots of quaint homes, really full of character. They're smaller homes like bungalows or cottages and smaller lots, but lots of trees. The Broad Ripple Neighborhood website says that they actually do a historic home tour, and it's actually this fall, and I have a link in our sources in case you want to go. So at this time, the family are living on Guilford Avenue in a house that's a little bit under 1,100 square feet, which is about 102 square meters. It has two bedrooms and one bathroom. The house is, it's small, but it's really charming. We have a photograph of the front of the outside of the house, and we have a couple of um, uh, diagrams of the layout, but I'm just going to try to describe it to you briefly so you can kind of picture this house in your head. So it was built in 1929, and across the front of the house is a screened-in porch. Off the porch, like once you're on the porch, there's the front door. You open the front door and you walk into the living room, and the living room was the front of the house. And then 
moving toward the rear of the house through the living room. On the left was a dining area, then a kitchen. There was a back door in the kitchen, and it was the kind of door where I think you went down a couple stairs, and then you could either go outside to the backyard or turn on the landing and continue down to the basement. The right side of the house, again, you're facing the house from the front door. At the back was the master bedroom, and then there was a bathroom, and then there was the second bedroom, which was Buddy's room. So the schematics, the sort of diagrams we have, show that the master bedroom had two single beds, and Buddy's room had a single bed for him. There was no interior stairway up to the attic anywhere. It is a a one-and-a-half-story house, which is actually, my house is the same, one-and-a-half stories. They probably just have like a pull-down somewhere that they use for storage, Griswold style, right? On the left side of the house is the driveway, and that takes you back to a detached garage that sort of back behind the house at the end of the driveway. The lots are very small, as you'd expect living in a city, but it's definitely got more of a suburban look to it. Like, everything I've seen about this neighborhood, you could set a sitcom here. Do you know what I mean? Like, Leave It to Beaver could Mm. have been set here. I would love to live here. It looks like a really, it, it just looks like a really sweet neighborhood. So Malvina, she's described as being typically Southern, very welcoming, vivacious, fun, and warm. She is five foot six inches tall and 145 pounds. So that is 171 centimeters and 66 kilograms. So I would say she is of, is that average height? She's going to be, yeah. I'd I'd say that's average height. So yeah, she's, she's, I'm trying to say it like she's an average size woman or she's a slender woman. And she's beautiful. She's got fair skin and dark hair, and her eyes have that kind of sparkliness to them. She does work with the local church. She's involved with the PTA at Buddy's school. I did look up, um, just because I don't want to assume that everybody's coming from the American perspective, you probably hear the term PTA a lot. It's the Parent Teacher Association. I actually looked it up so I could tell you all what the mission statement is, because not having any children, like, it's all very vague to me. And so their mission statement on their website says, quote, PTA's mission is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Their website also says, quote, many of the benefits our children receive today, such as universal kindergarten, the national school lunch program, and a juvenile justice system were accomplished as a result of the PTA mission, end quote. So that's the PTA. It's sort of Deciding what's right for the children in your school. Uh, what else do you need to know about Melvina? Yeah, very doting, loving mother. The papers mentioned she was seeing doctors for a thyroid problem and that she also suffered from a bad back and was also seeing a therapist. More on that later. But she sounds like one of us, right? In 1958, Melvina is 41, her husband is 48, and Buddy is like 9 or 10. Now we're going to get into the terrible events of her death. And again, I've pieced this together with a, like mostly just a lot of newspaper articles. So apologies if I've missed anything or confused anything. That's on me. There's no one else to blame. All right. It's December 1957, so the month previous, and there had been a fire at the back of the house that had damaged the kitchen and the master bedroom, and Malvina was overseeing the repairs and renovations to the kitchen and bedroom, which is kind of exciting, right? Like, not that you want a fire, but... No, you don't want a fire. You don't want a fire, but the upside of something like that is you can then refurnish things in the way you want them, which maybe that's not how they were when you bought the house. So all these renovations are happening and repairs, and the home was just a hive of activity with workmen coming and going. And Malvina, by all accounts, was just thrilled to be overseeing everything and choosing wallpaper and flooring and fixtures. When I first was reading this, so all the papers describe her as being so busy with this renovation and people coming and going all the time. And in my head immediately, I was imagining the money pit, right? With this just (laughs) massive house with people coming and going all over the place. Just massive renovations, right? That's how I felt for a couple of weeks in winter. I was seriously, literally waiting, you know, to fall through a giant hole in the floor, (laughs) like money pit style. I would have been laughing. Yes. You're at this point where you're just laughing. You need a rug. You need That's why you need heirloom carpets. Yes. See? <laughs> People don't believe us when we tell them that heirloom carpets are worth the investment. 
Yeah, that's what I was imagining. But then I actually was able to look at the neighborhood and the houses, and they're actually these like really sweet, charming little cottages. So even if they had three or four workers in there, like my house would feel busy with four people working in here, right? It's not that much bigger than theirs. I think they had about 12 different workers coming and going throughout the the renovations. So that's busy. That's a lot. And so the family are living here very happily on Guilford Avenue. Well, mostly happily. More on that later. It's January 29th, 1958. The family has breakfast, Charles leaves for work, and Buddy heads off to school, which is School 55, which was only a 10-minute walk up Guilford Avenue and then across East 54th Street. It was just half a mile, so super easy walking distance, even for children. Did he walk to school? Yeah. I, yeah, that's okay. the impression I got. I think sometimes she picked him up, but the norm was that he walked, yeah. At 12.10, Buddy gets back home from school for lunch, and when he gets home, his mother, his mother's car is there, and his mother, though, is in the bathroom. She wasn't feeling well, and apparently this is something that happened frequently enough that he didn't think it was that odd. There was a sandwich and a glass of milk waiting for him on the kitchen table, which was the norm. While he was eating, I guess the milkman came. So he talks to his mom through the door about their dairy needs for the coming week. And then he goes back and says to the milkman, just our regular delivery, please. That's only important because he notices her car was there. We'll discuss it later. Usually when Buddy was done with school, he'd have his paper out, right? Which we discussed, which must have been in the afternoon. Because that day, Melvina had told him not to worry about his paper route and that she would take care of it for him. So if she's telling him that at noon, then it must have been an after-school paper route. This is how I've kind of worked out the timelines. Mm, mm. So Buddy finishes his sandwich, which I'm imagining was peanut butter and fluff, but I'm not sure <laughs> if they had fluff yet. And said goodbye to his mother, who was still in the bathroom. I'm imagining this kid is like nine or ten, right? And I did map out the address of the school and the address to the house, and it works out to be an 11, 11 minute walk. So that's why I think he was walking and not like riding a bike or anything. But I'm imagining he's racing back to school to meet up with his friends because they probably get to play in the playground for a little bit before the bell rings, right? I don't know for sure, but it's how I'm imagining it. The next thing that happened was Melvina had a friend named Mildred, and Mildred was planning to come over that day because Melvina had wanted to show the progress that was being made on the renovations. And also, for some reason, Mildred had a jacket for Buddy. Not sure what the backstory was about the jacket. It doesn't really matter. She called the house at 1245 to let Melvina know that their friend Florence was going to take her. I think there must have been some previous, like, hey, I'm going to come on this day. Do you need me to pick you up? Do you, you know, this kind of thing. But again, they said, oh, we'll figure it out on the day. So this is them figuring it out on the day. So she calls the house, says, hey, our friend our friend Florence is going to take me, and we're going to set off soon. We'll see you in about an hour. But Mildred said, okay, a few things. First, the man who answered the phone was not Charles. And she assumed it was just a workman who had picked up the phone. And so she said, you know, may I speak to Malvina, please? And there was just this long pause. And I think, I think the man said something like, oh, well, like, uh, like it was that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. Mildred doesn't have time for this. And so she says, can you just tell Malvina, this is Mildred, tell Malvina that we're coming. And then she heard Malvina say, I should say she heard a woman who she thought was Malvina. It probably was. But she said either, quote, tell her I'll pick her up at 1.30 today, or tell them to come after 1.30, or tell her not to pick me up today. Okay. Different sources report exactly what was said to whom and by whom, but I think that whatever it was, I think like they called, they couldn't quite figure it out, and they must have said, oh, it's fine. We're just gonna, we'll just go to her place, you know. As the women are pulling up to Melvina's house, they were arriving at about 1.45 in the afternoon, as they said they would, and they see Melvina's car, which was a two-tone gray and white 1955 Buick hardtop. At first, Mildred apparently says to Florence, like, honk the horn, she's leaving, she's going to miss us. And as the car kind of passes them, they see it's a man behind the wheel wearing a hat. And initially they thought, that's odd, you know, but then they were like, well, maybe somebody had to run to the hardware store for something, you know, just real quick, which I guess had happened occasionally. 
she must have told them. You know what I mean? Like, oh, the builder had to borrow my car mm-hmm. today, that kind of thing. So they're not that worried. So they go to the front door, and they knock on the door for a while, but then their knuckles start to hurt, and there's no answer. So they hoof it around to the back of the house, and there they find the back door is slightly open, which, no thank you. Can I just say, sorry, but as an aside, that happens all the time in films and TV shows, right? Where you arrive home and your door is open, like somewhat ajar, and they don't have dogs or anything like that. And then people go in. Like, would you not? I wouldn't. I mean, not in this case. This is a different thing. But do you know what I mean? I'm like, who are these people? I would just call the police. It's something, I don't know. It's just a horror movie trope, maybe. But in this case, they were like, oh, look, that's great. The door's open. So they went on into the house, and both of the bedroom doors were closed. And they went in and they sat down in the living room to wait. And after about 15 to 20 minutes of waiting in the living room, they left a note for Malvina. One of the newspapers says that they left a chiding note. So they left a note and they left the jacket that they had for Buddy and they continued on with their day. Okay, what do you mean by chiding note? Like, that means kind of angry, right? Yeah. We're friends, angry. I mm-hmm. think, like, ang- like annoyed, maybe. Like, mm. I feel like chiding and scolding are very similar. Like, you would chide a child. Yeah, That yeah. doesn't come trippingly off the tongue. So I think they might have written, I didn't see the note. I don't know, you know, I'm sure the police have it for whatever, but it was probably just something like, we told you you were coming, but unfortunately you weren't here. You know, things look great. Sorry we missed you. You know, next time, call me yeah. back. You know, not angry, but like also not pleased. Mm. So they leave. Now, Charles Crutz, he was a salesman for a shipping line, trucking, I believe, and he'd had a pretty normal day. He had done sales calls in the morning and then had visited a friend of his, also named Charles, that afternoon. He gets home from work at a little after 5 p.m., and he notices that Malvina's car is not in the garage or in the driveway. Inside the house, he finds nine-year-old Buddy watching his favorite television show, which was The Adventures of Wild Bill Hickok. It was nominated for an Emmy that year. I asked my dad, my dad was here this weekend, and I was like, did you ever watch The Adventures of Wild Bill Hickok when you were a kid? And he, my dad was just like, no, Wild Bill Hickok never interested me. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so Wild Bill Hickok is interesting. I know. Well, he would have been a kid. I have to, They're kind of I the have same to talk age. to your dad about that. I know. The, he I, got shot. Dead man's hand, you know, playing poker. Yes. I'm sure Paul knows about it. He might. We should do an episode. So good. Deadwood. He died in Deadwood. Let's do an episode. Seriously. Mm. I don't know enough about the American West. All right. Well, people loved the show. It was om- it was nominated for an Emmy, and it was syndicated. I remember reading that about it. So Charles finds Buddy watching television. I'm sure the kid came straight home and parked his ass directly in front of the TV, like we all did, all the <laughs> latchkey kids of the 80s, right? And mm. he... He says to his son, he's like, hey, where's your mom? So Buddy tells his dad that his mom had said at lunchtime that she would take care of his papers, and so he thought she was out delivering his newspapers. And then Buddy is quoted as saying to his father that he didn't like the looks of the bedroom. Charles is like, okay. Like, because what does that mean? Like, honest to God, can you imagine your child just being like, I don't like the looks of the bedroom. But Charles is like, I'll take a look. But he goes into the bathroom to wash up. And he opens the door to the bathroom. And he sees that the shower curtain was closed. And usually it was open. And that must have given him a kind of a, a bad feeling. And then also there was, a, there was a towel bar that had been taken off the wall in the sink. Opening the shower curtain, unfortunately, his worst fears are realized. Malvina's lifeless body is in the tub. She is under the water in a sort of twisted position. The way I imagine it from the the way I've read it described is that almost like she was on her side in the fetal position, and then the top half of her body had been twisted to face up. The bath was filled to the overflow valve, and the water, which was still lukewarm, was not running. It had been turned off. She had cuts and bruising on her face, and there was blood in her mouth. She was wearing her bra, a white blouse, and a cardigan sweater with only the top button done up, and that had been torn. So the papers describe her as wearing, quote, mukluks, M-U-K-L-U-K-S. I looked up mukluks, and they're more like boots, but then some of the other papers said sneakers, and I know you're saying 
why does it matter? It kind of matters a little bit. She's wearing some kind of footwear. Okay, so some places mm-hmm. say mukluks, which I imagine more like a moccasin, like a house slipper. But then other places say sneakers. So maybe, a, I, I don't know. Shoes. She did have on underwear, but they were rolled down in the back to around her knees, right? Which, like, she was dragged and they just rolled mm-hmm. in the back down. We'll get into that discussion later. Under her body in the tub were, uh, so there was like a non-skid rubber mat thing, you know, that thing for safety. And then there were two fabric, like, bath mats, rugs, bath rugs, I guess, that had also ended up underneath her in the in the bath. The kind of thing you step on exactly. when you get out of the show. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And her body was still warm. Charles calls for help at 5.11 p.m. The coroner, Dr. Roy Storms, arrives. He was quoted as saying, quote, she definitely drowned and she had a blow above the left eye. I don't think she fell into the tub. I think it was murder. She had abrasions on her lip, a small cut. She either struck something or somebody struck her. I think somebody struck her, end quote. So he determined that she had been murdered and her cause of death was actually drowning due to a traumatic semarachnoid hemorrhage. So she had been punched hard enough to cause a brain bleed, and that would have knocked her unconscious. Was she maybe hit with the towel bar? Possibly. I think, I think people actually think that she may, one theory is that she may have come to and grabbed the towel bar and Mm -hmm. tried to fight him. Another theory is that he, because he was carrying her, he knocked it off the wall just carrying mm-hmm, her body mm-hmm. or trying to get her body sure, into the tub. Yeah. And then they're not really sure. They don't mention there being any blood or anything on it. So it's hard to know okay. exactly. Yeah. But I think the towel bar thing is definitely part of like the struggle, probably. Yeah. I think, I hope that the, that the really serious punch knocked her unconscious. And then that was it. That was just it. Good night. She didn't suffer anything else, you know? Her death certificate does say under Section 20B, which is describe how injury occurred, and it says, quote, found dead, submerged in water, filled bathtub in home where she had been placed while unconscious from blow or blows on head, end quote. There was no evidence of her having been raped, uh, despite having been partly undressed. All right, so now let's talk about some of the evidence. You remember, because we just said it, A minute ago, Buddy saying he didn't like the looks of his room. So what exactly is going on, right, in there for a kid to be like, I don't like the looks of my room. Oh, creepy. Um, well, it looks like that's where the struggle took place, unfortunately. I know that the Buddy's, like, dresser that had some of his toys and books, things were strewn around, some some of his model airplanes had been knocked over. The bedspread was sort of messed up. There were two pillows on the floor. Some sources say that there were two pillows covered by a blanket made to make up like a pallet. But all of the diagrams, and by all I mean both of them, show (laughs) pillows as being scattered. Like one is closer to the head of the bed and one is closer to the foot of the bed. The pillows provided some clues, though, because the coroner did make note of some blood staining and mucus found on one of the pillows. Uh, I saw a few things that made a really big deal about there being blood on the pillow, but it seems that the blood and mucus staining were the sort of thing that you wouldn't even notice. You'd have to really kind of closely look at it, right, in order to see it. So tiny amounts. And in one article, the coroner mentions that the staining also was not enough blood to indicate that she was really beaten up. I think it was just one serious punch. And he also thought that maybe she had been smothered or somebody had tried to smother her, and that's why the blood and mucus was on the pillow. Also found in Buddy's room, this one I really don't like, were Melvina's trousers, her pants. They had been torn, although they don't say how torn, right? Because this is also frustrating. Like, were they ripped down the side or was a button missing? Do you know what I mean? It All it says is torn. Same I mean, with her yeah, sweater. There are various levels of, of things being torn. Yeah. Could be completely ripped apart or just, you know, right, some little tear. Something. Yeah. But it just says torn. That's not the upsetting part. The upsetting part to me is that they were inside out and soaking wet. So we're going to circle back to that. Like they've been pulled down. Yeah. 
like they were taken mm. off her after she went into the tub. But she had shoes on. So somebody, the, the coroner believed that they had been removed from her in the tub. And that starts to get confusing because... Do we know what kind of pants? Toreador pants. And I looked that up. And so imagine, like, close your eyes. Imagine quintessential late 50s, early 60s, high-waisted, slim-fitting capri pants. Mm-hmm. A slim fitting. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, very odd, like very Audrey Hepburn if they were black. I think hers were mm-hmm. red and green. But yeah, a very slim fitting. So they would have taken off her shoes, taken off her pants, but after she was in the tub. And then put the shoes back on. And then put the shoes back on. But they never mentioned that there was a lot of water. Well, we'll talk about this a little bit more. It's just something to kind of start to think about, right? It's just weird. They also found a pencil in the room, and it had uh, writing on it, you know, like an embossed advertisement. Uh, and some of Malvina's hair was in the pencil. Also, that towel rack, so like we said, that had either been torn off the wall. There was definitely signs of a struggle. One article, the police said that maybe she had come to and tried to fight off her attacker by, like, grabbing onto the towel bar. But there was nothing to really indicate one way or another what the situation was, why the towel bar was in the sink. There was no conclusive fingerprints or blood or anything like that 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 was made public that I could find. In the kitchen, behind the door, going out to the backyard and down to the basement, again, so they just mentioned that there was a towel with some blood stains, but there's no specificity about how much blood or whose. It's just strange. Nothing was stolen. Malvina's purse and wallet containing cash were in the house, as were everything of value, her jewelry. There was nothing that was stolen. Going back and looking at that timeline of the day, Buddy was the last person known to have seen his mother alive, and that was after breakfast when he left for school. Because remember that while he came home for lunch and had a conversation with his mother, he never actually saw her. She was in the bathroom the entire time, so, you know, 15, 20 minutes maybe. I don't know how long it takes to eat a sandwich. In the historic Indianapolis Crimes book, it says that Melvina had told Buddy she wasn't feeling well, and that's why she was in the bathroom, and apparently it had happened before. But with 2020 hindsight, I then started to wonder, is it possible that maybe she wasn't alone in the bathroom? Mm. Like, is it possible that maybe somebody was in the bathroom with her, making sure she stayed in the bathroom? That's what I was just thinking, and it's a really scary thought. Really scary. Yeah, it's disconcerting, isn't it? It's just creepy. And the milkman I mentioned, because he did confirm that her car was there. So probably she was there. We know she was there. It wasn't someone else behind the door. Like, she wasn't taken from the home. But we don't know if she was alone. But he would have recognized his mom's voice. Totally. Yeah, I think you're right. And what about the man who left with the car? The the head guy, when her friends arrived? Excellent question. So they were unable to describe the man they saw, except to say that he was wearing a hat. There was another neighbor who had reported seeing a man jump into Malvina's car and leave. And this witness was a teenage boy, I believe. And he thought the man he had seen was black, but didn't have any other useful information. Her car was found the next morning, 11 blocks away. The car keys were never found. What's a little bit odd about her car being found is that there are quite a few witnesses in the neighborhood where her car was found who swore up and down that the car had absolutely been there since at least the day before. So there's a little bit of a Mandela effect kind of situation happening with her car there, whether there was a glitch in the matrix or everyone's just really awful eyewitnesses. Because we know, right, that eyewitness testimony really is not great. (laughs) But for some reason, it just... It's, there's just, it's weird little things that I find creepy in this episode, and mm. I don't know why. Unsettling. Yes. I think unsettling, unsettling is the Unsettling right is word. the word. Yeah. It's like my spider sense is tingling. <laughs> my, my Annie tingle. All right. I'll talk more about the car, but I just can't stop also thinking about her friends waiting for her sitting in the living room because it's more than likely that they saw her murderer leave and she mm. was dead in the bathtub while they were writing her that note. Yeah. It's just, I think that's pretty, yeah. Yeah. The body was still warm, but that was because the water was warm, right? Exactly. So exactly. It could have been hours. Sometime during the day. It could yeah. have been hours, exactly. Yeah. 
So there were three unidentified fingerprints that were found on the doors. I think specifically it was like the door to the master bedroom and also the bathroom. And it seems like they actually removed the doors and brought them in for testing, but they never found a match. Did they test all the all the all the workers who were in and out of the? Mm -hmm. I believe they did. Yeah, I think so. And I think they all took polygraphs too. The pencil that they found, so it seemed to have a few strands of Malvina's hair, and everybody got really excited because, quote, White County REMC Monticello was embossed, like, on the side of them, and they thought, oh, this is going to be a really good lead. You know, we're going to find one of the workers had this or whatever, but it turns out they were able to track down the pencils, and over a thousand had been made by an electric company that was about an hour away from where she was killed. So it wasn't really the clue they hoped it would be. Like, tons of people had these pencils. They were, it was just, it wasn't really a, a useful lead. I think the consensus now is she just had a pencil that she'd tucked behind her ear to make notes on all the things that she was doing. Because uh, she was busy. She was doing the house. She was doing the PTA. She was involved in the church. She's a busy lady. Okay, so I've seen a few places where people wonder whether Buddy might have been involved in his mother's murder. But we need to talk about the possibility of whether or not Buddy might have been involved. And I think it was Cold Case Detective said that some people wonder, like, I think they said something like, but people think that it's weird that he never used the bathroom when he came home from school. But when I was nine or 10, I was like a camel. I don't know. I don't find it that weird. If he got home around 3.30 and his dad was home at five, like, I don't think it's that weird to not use the bathroom for an hour and a half, is it? Uh, to me, it is, but oh, I maybe. mean, I don't know. All right. They also thought that, you know, there were some marks on her face, and could those have been made with the sharpened point of a pencil? Like, had he stabbed her in the face with a pencil? I don't think so, though. I mean, if nothing else, if he had killed his mother, he wouldn't have been able to lift her into the tub. Right? I mean, he was nine or ten. It would have been pretty hard. Yeah. And I do find the comment about how he didn't like the looks of his room very odd, to be honest. Yeah. I wonder how much of that is really an exact quote and how much of that is the father speaking. Yeah, that's true. Do you know what I mean? Like Or he might have been like, hey, dad, my room looks weird. You know what I mean? He yeah. might have said something like that. And then when Charles was talking to the police, he might have said, you know, well, he didn't like the looks of his room. You know, I could maybe that makes sense. I, I get the uh, I get the appeal of thinking maybe he was involved, but I just can't see anything. I mean, the, the only motive would have been to not to have to not deliver his papers. And even then, it only would have bought him one day. But no, I haven't seen anything that would remotely imply that he had anything to do with this, other than, of course, being another victim, right? Because his mother was taken away. I think the other thing is, you know, his mom was a, she was a stay-at-home mom and a homemaker in the 1950s. So I'm not sure how much a kid, like a nine-year-old child, would question weird things, especially with work going on in the house. On the 7th of February, 1958, Malvina's husband, Charles, as well as his friend that he had visited the day of the murder, his name was also Charles, they were interrogated and given polygraph tests separately, and they were cleared as suspects. I think Charles had been interrogated for around 10 hours and passed three polygraph tests. He had been really willing to help police. The only thing that he had asked is if they could please wait until after Malvina's funeral, so that's why it was the week later. One reason that Charles seemed particularly suspicious is that Malvina had filed uh, for divorce, and this had happened on January 13th, and she also had sought a restraining order because she felt that her husband was a bad influence on their son is the way I've understood this. And so she had requested this, and there was supposed to be a hearing to see whether or not a judge agreed it was necessary. And they were supposed to show up in court on January 17th, but they both decided to reconcile, and they didn't go, and the matter was dropped. And both her attorney, Malvina's divorce attorney, And her close friends had confirmed this. This is the second time that she had filed for divorce. The first time had been in the early 50s, so twice in less than 10 years. The reason given for the requested divorce was, quote, 
marital misconduct, and gross and wanton negligence of conjugal duties over a 10-year period, end quote. Okay, so that's something to think about. It seems like so he wasn't interested in sex with his wife, but was maybe involved with someone outside the marriage, right? Because there's your marital misconduct and then negligence of conjugal duties, which is an interesting way of putting not enough sex, right? My immediate assumption reading this, and please tell me if you think I'm way off base here, but I'm guessing that Charles was probably gay and struggling to live a double life, which is what a lot of people had to do back then, Mm. have to do, I should say, have to do even today, depending on where you live, you know. I know of a few relationships where a couple were married and it turned out one of them was gay. And it doesn't mean they were a bad person. They weren't intentionally trying to hurt the person they married. They sincerely did love their spouse and children, just not the way you should love a spouse, maybe, or the way that would lead to more children in a marriage because that I could see if she had wanted more children and he I think uh I think you're I think you're spot on honestly yeah I can't think of any other and it's just a sad situation right because having re- if they've reconciled twice then I'm sure they loved each other very much and they loved their child and everybody was just doing the best they could in a in a really shitty situation right So we know that in addition to being treated for a thyroid condition and for back pain, uh, I think she had a slip disc, so that's no fun. But we know that she was also seeing a therapist. And I'm guessing it's because, at least in part, right, because she was married to someone who couldn't love her the way she wanted to be loved. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know if that's true. But the reasons she gives for wanting a divorce certainly make you wonder if that's what happened, right? Mm. And was the friend Charles was visiting maybe more than a friend? That said, I don't think her husband had anything to do with her death and neither did the police. Uh, His alibi checked out and everything I've seen and read indicates that regardless of whatever was happening with his preferences sexually, he loved her and he loved Buddy and... He wanted to keep their family together, I think. Okay, so we have the husband, we have the son. Uh, both are more or less cleared. We have the unknown head-wearing man driving her car, but do we have any other suspects? I mean, there were people in and out of the house yep, there were. at that time. Yep. So as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong here, but unfortunately, I think, every well, I understand based on the witnesses, but I think everybody who was held was... Mostly black men. There were quite a few that were sort of held briefly before being cleared. One suspect was a painter and wallpaper hanger by the name of Robert Smith. He was a 37-year-old father of seven with no criminal record of any kind. And he had worked in the Crutz home on January 23rd, 24th, and 25th. But he denied having anything to do with Melvina's death. And he had been working on another job when the murder had happened. He was interrogated for over 10 hours, I think, and was given several polygraphs. He was finally released. I think he was held for a few days. They also arrested and then later released a hitchhiker in the area. The, everybody loves a hitchhiker, right? If you're law enforcement, because then it's not a problem in your town. It was an outsider that came in and, and did this terrible thing. But no, it wasn't the hitchhiker. The next suspect, and I think the one that I sort of like the most, was a man named Leroy Pennick. He was a painter who had been interrogated and failed lie detector tests. And on February 19th, he was charged with Malvina's murder. He had three lie detector tests showing that he was being squirrely about something. He was released a week later because there wasn't enough evidence to keep him tied to Malvina's death. But this is why I just like him so much and like him for the crime. In 1962, he was found guilty in the fatal beating death of his longtime girlfriend, she's often referred to as his common-law wife, Carol Jean Martin. It was a horrifically violent beating. And just the few articles I read about him, I like him as a suspect. Like, he seems... Terrible. He seems like somebody who's capable of mm-hmm. that. For yeah, you. somebody who likes, he enjoys hurting women. I think I can say that pretty unequivocally. Yeah. In June of 1958, a man named James Rogers turned himself into police for a number of crimes. And one of them was that he confessed to murdering Melvina. 
And while he did have a history of check fraud and grand larceny, police did not think he was their man, and they said that a number of the facts he had given them about the murder were incorrect. I know one of them was that he said that he had struck her and then put her in a bath of cold water, and we know the bath water wasn't cold, right? So that was an easy thing that, that he got wrong. I'm sure the police had more information that they didn't release to the papers, but the article I read where he was released, the police described him as being an ill man. So I think he just had, I think it was just somebody who was mentally ill and confessing to crimes, which I never understand the false confessions. There's so many of them. There was one last clue, but it was unfortunately found a little bit too late. So at the time of the murder, the Indianapolis Star, the newspaper, had offered a $5,000 reward for a tip leading to an arrest and conviction in the case. And of course, they were flooded with tips. I did not do the math, but $5,000 in 1958 was a lot of money. One of the tips seemed very credible. In fact, so credible, they thought it could be a winning tip. And so the paper wrote 5000 on it and gave it to the police. And they lost it. Misplaced it, I should say. In December 1960, so two years after, they found the tip. And to quote, this is the book, to quote Cavender, quote, the letter writer said that he was passing an intersection only a few blocks from the Crutz house on the day of the slaying and saw a man leaving a car on Meridian Street, the main north-south street in Indianapolis, and the street where the Crutz car had been found. Quote, he ran like a speed racer south on Meridian, quote, the writer continued, just as the light was changing. While crossing the street, he made a movement toward his cap, a painter's type, but seemed to toss something toward the west, end quote. Later, the tipster said he was passing the same area and saw some boys pick up something and heard them say that somebody evidently had lost their car keys. The letter writer described the man he saw as very dark complexioned and having a mustache. Another witness, who had seen the Krutz car being driven away from the house, described the operator as an African American. Police urged the letter writer to contact authorities, but nothing came of it. The tipster's identity remains as mysterious as the identity of Melvina Krutz's killer. End quote. And that's when the case went cold. And I mean, I don't want to say cold. They did do a lot of interrogations and lie detector tests, but I don't think the case was ever particularly that hot. They had some fingerprints that were never matched. The house was, of course, bustling because of all the, you know, renovations and everything going on. And they had all kinds of fingerprints from all those people, right? There were just so many fingerprints in the house anyway. Yeah. And nothing was computerized back then. So. Uh, you said the car keys were the, were missing and no other valuables. Nothing was taken. Yeah, nothing, that's nothing. right. Nothing. And I think the car keys were in a bowl in the kitchen. So really easy to see if you were running out the back door. Mm -hmm. So easy for somebody who wouldn't even know where they are to take them. And yes, exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Another problem was that the case was passed from like detective to detective for just various reasons. I think maybe if it had been, if there had been just even just one investigator who had been on it from the beginning and stayed with it, there could have potentially have been a different outcome. But yeah, it kept getting transferred around. At one point, they, I think because the suspects were black, they had two black police officers working the case, but then they were taken off pretty quickly as well. I don't know. It's, I don't know why so many people got this case. The police do believe that a struggle took place in Buddy's room, where Malvina was beaten, maybe smothered, and then dragged unconscious to the bathroom. There are two drawings of the room. I sent them to you so you could see them. It kind of looks like the bedspread that they talk about being in disarray. It almost looked to me like if you were on the floor and trying to grab onto something. Like, it looked like it had been pulled down from one corner toward the floor, maybe? One of the articles I read said that probably the bath mats, like the bath rugs that were underneath her, were because she was dragged into the bathroom, and then the killer probably just, when they lifted her up, they lifted everything that was under her, or like accumulated under her as she was being dragged, right? And that would explain why her underwear was sort of rolled down just in the back, as if she was being dragged. One thing I find weird, nothing I read indicated that there was like a bunch of water on the floor of the bathroom, which, it, it's not a surprise because we... We know the coroner thinks that she was already unconscious when she was placed in the water, so there wasn't any kind of struggle in the water. But that means that the killer would have put her body in the tub, 
turned on the tap, filled the tub with hot water, right? Because when the coroner got there at 5, after 5, like 5.30-ish, 6 o'clock, the water and her body were both still warm. Lukewarm, but warm. And so they couldn't be sure of time of death. So whoever killed her put her in a tub, filled the tub with water, watched her drown, then turned off the taps so the taps wouldn't overflow. Like, that's very cold. Do you know what that's mm. like? And they found her wet trousers in Buddy's room soaking, soaking wet. So was she fully dressed? It seems like not because... Because when she was dragged, her underwear was rolled exactly. down. Exactly. Right. Is it possible that she was maybe in the in the process of changing or putting on her pants or taking off her pants when th- this happened and she got hit on the head, was unconscious, the person dragged her to the bathroom, put her in the tub with the bath mats, threw the pants on her, turned on the water, then was like, okay, the pants... It's possible. Maybe he was worried that the pants would clog the... The overflow valve? Oh, I maybe. But if he was there to turn off the taps... Yeah. Then... She was probably not wearing the pants when she was dragged. No, I don't think so. And, you know, there's always a possibility, too, that she could have been having an affair with somebody. She could have been consensually removing pants. That's a possibility. Yeah. We just don't know. You know, it's just... If she had wanted to divorce him because of... What was it? It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the conjugal bit. It was the other part, the the part that indicated that maybe he had had an affair, right? So maybe mm-hmm. she decided if if that was the case, maybe she was going to find somebody of her own, you know, who would, you know, maybe they decided to stay together but kind of have a more open marriage because of his sexuality. Again, I don't think that's a crazy idea. Also, the shoes thing, the shoes and the the shoes and the pants thing is it, the pants and it just bothers me, right? Because like, I don't. They're just. It just doesn't make sense. I just don't understand it. Had she interrupted a burglar? Like, did a burglar break in while she was getting dressed? Maybe. Another thing that was odd and unsettling is that after the murder, calls were made to the house by a woman who had a vaguely southern accent. And the caller would call, and Charles would answer, and the woman would say, Hello, is this Mrs. Mr. Crutz? And he would say, Yes, it is, and she would hang up. This was after Melvina had died, and when Mildred heard about this, the friend that had heard the conversation, you know, she said that the man who had answered the phone that day, who she thought was a worker, had also had a southern accent. So some people now wonder, is it possible that the woman making the phone calls and the man that was heard on the phone... Is it possible that they were linked somehow? Is it possible that the woman that they heard talking wasn't Melvina? I think it was, though. So Charles passed away in 1980 at the age of 70. I assume that Buddy is still out there somewhere, and I really hope for him and the rest of her family that maybe someday this case will be looked at again if they still have any evidence left. The technology we have today can maybe help figure out exactly what did happen, because... That is the very sad and, to me, quite unsettling story of the unsolved murder of Malvina Kratz. Yeah, the word is unsettling. It's unsettling to me. Yeah. The wet pants are unsettling to me. Yep. I can't even say why exactly, because, it, as I say, it's still possible that she took it off or that she was in the middle of changing. Or But it's uh, it makes me very uneasy. The whole thing makes me very uneasy. And what was the motive? Nothing was missing. Not a burglary. Not... She was not raped. It's yeah, it's just it's just all just very creepy, you know. Especially the like, what happened with the pants? I just don't understand yeah. how. Like something ha- there has to be something with that, and I really hope the police just have a detail right that they're keeping away from us, and eventually maybe it'll make sense. But until then, that's it. That's all we've got. Do you have something good? Uh, something good. My mom's side of the family were here on Sunday for the first time to look at the house. And nice. it was such a nice weather. We had such a lovely Sunday. I haven't seen most of them for over two years. The weather was perfect. We were sitting in the garden the whole day. So it was really, really nice. I enjoyed it. That's definitely my something good this week. That's nice. It snowed here on Sunday. It was, Ooh. yeah, it was snowing. So, yeah, a couple of good things. One is Opus went to the vet. He's been seeing like an allergist. He's my biological dog. 
so he's been seeing an allergist and uh, we've never been into the vet with him ever since he was a tiny puppy. We've never been allowed. They take the dog from you at the door and that's it. Bring him back to your car. But this time they actually sent us photos because they were like, here are some photos of your very good boy. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so proud. So I'll have to share my Opus photos at the vet. <laughs> but it was really sweet. And also this coming weekend, just a reminder that there, I believe everything is sold out, but it is the preview of the film Lady of the Dunes that Charlie from Crime Lines and myself were uh, so happy to be able to really just do a very small part for. I'm not sure whether we're going to be really in the film or on the cutting room floor, but regardless, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Frank has done. Frank Durant is the filmmaker and looking forward to seeing that. And yeah, that'll be this weekend in Provincetown. I can't wait to hear what's happening. I know. I can't wait to tell you all about it. And then hopefully <laughs> there'll be a wider release and lots of other people will be able to see mm. it. Yeah. All right. All right. That's it. If you like this episode or any of our other episodes, please go to your podcast app and check if you can leave us a rating and or review. It really helps us out. Actually, it helps us to keep doing this because we it just does have actually. Yeah. yeah, it really gives us a lot of energy. Also, it helps us with the algorithm and makes other people find us more easily. They do. What was the one we just we just got a really great review too? The, the best review ever. It was <laughs> review 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 three hearts. It was five stars, three hearts, and then it was like review, review, review. So thank you for that because it cracked me up review, in the review, morning. Review. It was perfect. If you want to know more about our merch store, our email address, our PO box, our Facebook page, please go to our webpage, which is freshalpodcast.com. There you find all the links, everything that you need, also the link to our Patreon. Go to patreon.com, type in Fresh Hell Podcast, we pop right up. There you see all the tiers. We have three different tiers. And also, please go to podcastmagazine.com and vote for us in the Podcast Hot 50. You can leave one vote daily. Try to get us into the top 10. That would be my goal. And his goal is 1,000 reviews on iTunes US. Yeah. My goal is top 10 on the Podcast Hot 50. Also, tell your pets we said hi, we love them, we miss them. We're wrapping up because Annie's construction construction site next door is going crazy. It really is. I'm so I'm so worried that you're really gonna hear it a lot at the halfway through this, but it's fine. But we're gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and they're gonna be done soon. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. That's it. If you like us are going through hell, <laughs> keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.